Hey guys, guess who's back? We believe God gave you an intelligently designed brain and he expects you to use it. Now remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com, that's me, or genesisweek.com, that's the show. And you can find us and also subscribe to my YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Once again, an intrepid reporter called my attention to a fascinating article regarding artificial enzymes being produced in the lab without DNA or RNA. Now let me explain the technical lingo first so you can truly understand the humor of the situation. The evolutionary paradigm seeks to explain life and diversity of species without intelligent design, without a creator. That's a very weird way of phrasing it. You make it sound as though Darwin intentionally set out to disprove God when he went on his voyage and developed a theory of evolution and that evolutionary scientists today are only researching evolution in order to try to disprove God rather than through curiosity-driven uh, research and passion. I assure you that it is curiosity that drives researchers today, not some sort of vain desire to disprove God. A huge factor in all of this, of course, is the rise of that first life. Now, as I've mentioned in multiple Crevo rants and on this show, life arising from non-life is in direct violation of well-established scientific and natural laws, such as the law of biogenesis. Now, the law of biogenesis is quite simple. Life only comes from life. Louis Pasteur disproved that highly developed complex life as we know it today cannot arise from pre-existing organic matter, such as maggots arising from rotting meat. He did not disprove that life cannot arise under any circumstances from non-living matter. You do not see life arising from a rock. Yet this is precisely what evolution propones. That life arose from minerals and chemicals in the pre oceans. Minerals and chemicals that came from the erosion of rocks. Now, you are certainly welcome to believe this, but let's call it what it is. If it violates scientific and natural law... Which part of the current model of abiogenesis uh, violates which scientific law? You've got to be more specific here, Ian. Then what you are proposing is neither scientific nor natural. It is, by definition, supernatural. A miracle. Check out Frogs Are Useful, Crevo Rants number 93 and 94, where I apply the well-established natural laws of biogenesis and thermodynamics to the origins debate. Now, some anti-creationists attempt to dance around the issue, claiming that evolution does not attempt to explain the origin of life. Yes, and they'd be right. Abiogenesis and evolution are not necessarily dependent on each other. Ah, see, like we're finally getting true to you. Oh, I'm glad. Hogwash! Ah, crap. Oh well, a man can dream. That is dishonesty in its highest form. And I demonstrated Crevo Rant number 63 that evolution and the origin of life are married to each other. If you have no life, evolution is dead at the starting line. So evolutionary theory must come up with a way in which life can arise without any pre-existing life. By that brilliant bit of logic, we can therefore say that the germ theory of disease is dependent on the origin of life, or the origin of germs. Because if there aren't, is no life and there's no germs, there's no disease, right? Right? The answer is, of course not. There are two separate theories. Evolution explains the diversity of life, how life has changed over the course of life's history. Abiogenesis only explains how life first started. 
and you can agree or disagree about how that life has begun, but it does not impact the validity of evolutionary theory and the science that has come from that over the last 150 plus years. The irony here being that researchers are literally trying to find out how a miracle happened, trying to deduce something that, by definition, is outside of the scientific and natural realm, and thus cannot be studied. Uh, the typical closed mind of a creationist. So there's absolutely no possibility of life arising naturally. None. Absolutely none. It must come from magic man, right? Right? Even attempting to build the very basic building blocks of life, amino acids, has insurmountable problems as was demonstrated in Miller's famous experiment and examination of amino acids found in meteorites, amino acids forming by natural processes form both left-handed... No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 ...and right-handed amino acids, mirror images of each other. Now, life only uses right-handed amino acids as left-handed amino acids are toxic to life. Okay, where to begin? Um, well, this is going to be a bit of a round to make absolutely sure that this is put to bed. <laughs> uh, I almost believed that. Okay, Miller's experiments provided the proof and concept that amino acids can form naturally. There are two claims here that creationists like to make when addressing Miller's experiments, and I'd like to address them both here, even though... Um, Ian only made one, but for the sake of uh, to, just to be thorough, I'd like to address the two of them. Okay, well first Ian, no life does not only use right-handed amino acids. There are bacteria that can use the left-handed version. And there are models to explain how mm, the majority of organisms on this planet began to use one type, use the one type of isomer such as selective destruction, which creates an imbalance of the certain isomer, of the right-handed isomer, which is then amplified. Life will adapt to use only the isomer that is in, a, in greater abundance. And the second point I'd like to bring up is that the mixture was toxic, because there was cyanide and formaldehyde found in the mixture. However, these compounds are important building blocks, uh, bio build, building blocks for biochemical compounds. This claim that these compounds would have been toxic to life in the early Earth seems kind of odd to me, as life today can survive in extreme conditions that we would consider extremely toxic, such as high temperatures, acidities, and use metals such as uranium and the highly dangerous plutonium as electron acceptors similar to how we use oxygen. Amino acids join together to form proteins, which is like putting nuts, bolts, and raw construction material together into small machines. The proteins. Define machine. Throwing in a bolt with left-handed threads will completely mess up the machine. Well, it's no different with life. The left-handed amino acids will join with the rest of the protein, thus destroying the protein. Now, completely ignoring the left-hand, right-hand problem, nature still cannot form even one protein. It's because the conditions of the Earth today do not allow for protein synthesis without the aid of cells, does not mean that earlier conditions could not accommodate protein synthesis. One major difference between modern Earth and early Earth is that early Earth was anoxic to condition the level of oxygen was quite low. I show this mathematically in Crevo Rant number 107. Now, our bodies make proteins using DNA, RNA, and an extremely complicated transcription system. It's weird, he's talking about transcription, although the animation behind him is actually of translation. Transcription is the, literally what it sounds like, transcribing the DNA code into an RNA message. 
translation is, well, translating that RNA message into protein. And although the transcription is mainly done by proteins, the translation is actually done by a ribozyme, which is actually made up of mostly RNA. Made of biological machines, which are made out of proteins, which were assembled using instructions contained within the DNA. So this is more like the extreme version of the chicken and the egg quandary. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, this is actually a nonsensical question, because it was neither. Correct indeed, Ian. Uh, finally, you actually realize you've done your research, I, I think. It wasn't uh, DNA or protein that came first, it was actually RNA. It was the chicken and the rooster that came about at the same time. You couldn't give me it, could you, Ian? You couldn't give me that one bit of hope, Ian. That one bit of hope. In like fashion, asking which came first, the DNA or the transcription system, is a nonsensical question. Because both the DNA and the transcription system came about at the same time. One cannot exist without the other. As we know them today. And just like any other machine, all the parts had to be designed and constructed at the same time by an outside intelligence. Now in chemistry, a catalyst is a compound or element which triggers or accelerates a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. In biology, we have what are called enzymes. Enzymes are like a biological catalyst. They trigger or accelerate biological processes. So in this most recent paper that just came out in Nature, the researchers made DNA in the lab, what they called XNA. The DNA is constructed of bases and a backbone, each made of certain chemical compounds. In the case of this synthetic DNA, they replaced the chemicals in the backbone with other chemicals. The proper term is actually nucleic acid. DNA and XNA are not the same molecule. It's like calling RNA DNA. They have two different sugar backbones. XNA was able to fold in such a three-dimensional way that it was able to do some biological jobs. It was, in effect, an enzyme. Now, the researchers have high hopes to be able to make enzymes not found in nature to do specific work within the body, for example. Now, this is fascinating and exciting research, but the twist to make all of this fit somehow, some way, into evolution and the origin of life from non-life is where it becomes downright funny. For instance, the headliner on the Science Alert article reads, World first, artificial enzymes suggest life doesn't need DNA or RNA. New scientists titled their article more boldly and blatantly. Synthetic enzymes hint at life without DNA or RNA. Now remember, we here at Genesis Week believe God gave you a brain to use it. And we hope that you did bring it with you today. If you did, you may have spotted the non-sequitors already. The headlines and the article are trying to imply that this artificial DNA can enlighten us on the alleged time before there was life. This article in The New Scientist seems to be more emphasizing that this discovery may allow us to consider that life, if it exists outside our planet, may not use RNA or DNA as a genetic material and may use a different type of nucleic acid. And how life may have evolved from non-life. Well, let's break it down. First of all, was any DNA involved in the process of making this artificial DNA? Was there any life in the mix before the XNA was produced? Now, if you read the paper, you might conclude, no. After all, they are competent researchers. Presumably, they were careful about keeping everything sterile and keeping watch for contamination. However, there was an obvious and huge contamination of both the DNA and pre-existing life inadvertently introduced into the experiment. 
right off the hop, the DNA from Taylor, Pinhiro, Smola, Morganov, Pikachu, Cousins, Weeks, Herduin, and Holliger was involved. After all, they were the ones who made this artificial DNA, and they exist only because of their DNA. They are also very much alive. So we also have pre-existing life and intelligent design involved in the experiment. Then you have the DNA, pre-existing life, and intelligent design of the engineers who made the intelligently designed equipment that these guys used to make their artificial DNA. There's a whole lot of DNA involved here, and a whole lot of pre-existing life, and a whole lot of intelligent design. The Ian, that's an impressive argument if it wasn't for the fact that it's based on a straw man. Nobody is saying that XNA can form naturally based on this experiment, except for that wee straw man in your head. What people are saying, though, is that, hey, this is a very interesting compound. This is a very interesting nucleic acid. Let us consider this for a candidate for looking for life outside of this planet. Or, hey, this is a very interesting compound. Uh, let us consider it in uh, our models on early life. Let us do some more testing for it and maybe worth looking at. That's all. At the moment, it's just, hey, this is an interesting compound. Let's do from some more work on it to see if our, if we can fit it into the current model or, or, or we can exclude it. Anyway, that's it for me. Back at these videos again for however long I can keep this up. I'm going into the last legs of my PhD. Cross my fingers. So... Yeah, if you like this video, let me know, give me a thumbs up and subscribe and check out the links below for more information about this video, who the video I'm responding to, and oh yes, uh, check out Trolling With Logic, uh, my po the podcast which I am uh, a part of, uh, for more content if you're discovering me from the first time. Bye guys.